Hi! In this video I will show you how we made an interpreter for a programming language, written in a programming language for which we are writing a compiler. If you've always wondered how programming languages are made, this video might be a good introduction. If you're new to this channel, I am a computer scientist, and with the help of a sizable community of dedicated people, I am making an operating system and a programming language. Technically I should be the operating system guy, and this fella here should be the programming language guy, but lately we kinda switched, so he's mostly doing the US, and I'm mostly doing the compiler. At any rate, what I'd like to show you today is how I used our language, which is called Perk, by the way, to write a simple interpreter. The fact that the language is powerful enough to let us easily write stuff like this is important to us, because it means that as soon as Perk is complete enough, we'll be able to rewrite its compiler in Perk itself. First off, if this is the first time you hear about Perk, it is a modern take on system languages with features such as option types, lambdas, type classes, algebraic data types, and parametric polymorphism. The Perk compiler is currently written in OCaml and generates C code, which is very useful because it allows us to interface the generated code with the kernel of our operating system, which is written in C, allowing very simple and beautiful integration between the two languages. Before moving on to the part in which I write the interpreter itself, I will showcase the single most important feature of Perk when it comes to doing this kind of stuff. The feature that allows us to write interpreters so easily are Perk's very powerful type definitions. These are essentially stolen from OCaml's algebraic data types. In Perk, you can define a type as a union of constructors. As an example, say I want to define a type value that can either hold a boolean or an integer. I can write something like this. We call integer and boolean two constructors. Then, in my main function, I can define two variables of type value, one of them being the integer 16, and the other one being the boolean false. In my code, I can distinguish between these two cases using a match statement, which is essentially a more powerful version of a switch statement. In this code, we discard the specific boolean or integer value, and we only distinguish between the constructors. If we want to match a specific value, we can put it in place of the underscore. Alternatively, we can capture the value of the variable using the keyword var. This kind of stuff begins to be useful when defining recursive types. As an example, we can define the type of binary trees as either the empty tree or a node consisting of a value and two binary trees, which are its children. This means that instead of thinking about structs and pointers and other things that are easy to mess up, we can just write recursive algorithms that do stuff like building and visiting trees by simply using the match statement. But binary trees are boring, let's jump straight ahead directly to the interpreter. An interpreter is a program that, given a piece of code written in its target language, executes it step by step. It works by splitting the source code into single commands, and by using these commands to progressively change an internal state. For example, given this program, the interpreter first changes its state by binding the variable x to the value 2, and then changes it again by setting x to x plus 5, and finally it prints the value of x. Clearly one of the subsystems of an interpreter is an arithmetic evaluator, which is a fancy way of saying a calculator. So let's begin by making a calculator. I'm sure you've made a calculator program before, but since this is going to be part of an interpreter, we're going to make it a little different. The user is going to write their mathematical expressions into a string, which we're going to feed to what's called a lexer, which is a program that takes strings and turns them into a list of tokens, and then we're going to feed the tokens to a parser, that in turn is going to turn them to an internal representation. This internal representation is what the program looks like to the interpreter, and will be defined with our handy perk type definitions. As for the lexing and parsing, I'll briefly tell you about how they're implemented at the end of the video. So, let's define the expressions of our programming language. An expression is either a number, or a binary operation like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and various comparison operators applied to two expressions. We store the binary operations in an additional type. Technically, there are also unary operations, that is, operations with a single argument, like negation, stuff like that, but to keep the language very simple, we can forget about those. Maybe consider it an exercise, go to the GitHub repo in the description and add unary operations. Additionally, an expression can be a variable, whose name can be stored into a string. 
As an example, these are all valid internal representations for expressions. The first one is the number 5, the second one is 5 plus 6, the third one is 5 minus x plus 6. Now that we have defined the type of expressions, we need to write the actual calculator that takes an expression and returns its value. For the return type, we can use the value type we defined earlier, the one with both numbers and boolean values. So, we define an evaluation function that takes two inputs, an expression and a hash table, and returns a value. The hash table maps strings to integers and is needed to store the values that are bound to the variables. Note that at this point, we still have no way to set a variable, only to gather its value from the hash table. The first thing we do is match over the expression, going case by case. If the expression is a variable, we just gather its value from the hash table, using the library function hashTableGet. This is a polymorphic function, so we need to instantiate it to the correct type, which in this case is int. The current syntax for this is the at symbol. We don't like this very much, and we're probably going to change it to the more common angle bracket notation from, say, Java generics. The second case is the case in which the expression is a number, in which case we simply return the number, and the matters are a bit more complicated, but not by a lot, when it comes to the recursive case of binary operations. First off, we call the evaluation function recursively on the two expressions e1 and e2, also passing the hash table. This way we obtain two values, those of the two inner expressions of the binary operation. Now we need to combine these values based on what the operation is. For example, if the operation is add, we return the sum of the two values. However, recall that the values can be integers, but also booleans. As an example, a comparison like is e1 equal to e2 does not return a number, it returns a boolean. We need to distinguish between these cases and forbid the user from writing something like 5 is bigger than 6 plus 2. So, what we do is check whether the operation is arithmetical or not, and then call one of two auxiliary functions compute arithmetic or compute comparison based on the result. The arithmetical function is pretty simple. It matches over the operation and returns true for the four arithmetical operations and false for everything else, which we represent with the underscore symbol. The compute arithmetic function takes a binary operation and two values. First, it performs a couple of checks on the input values. If either of them is a boolean, the program fails with a type error. If both are integers, their values are saved in two variables n1 and n2. Finally, with a match on the operation, the two variables are added if the operation is add, subtracted if the operation is sub, and so on, with particular care in the case of division by zero. The compute comparison function is essentially the same, but for comparison operators. If you're feeling fancy, you can try and add some operations that take booleans as input, like and, or, etc., and see how the structure changes. However, our calculator is now complete. Let's try it out. Now for the actually fun part, commands. Everybody likes telling computers what to do. Commands are the recipes you provide computers, which they have to obey, otherwise you will mistreat them. Transistor slavery. We now need to define the internal representation, or abstract syntax tree, of the commands, in a very similar way to how we did so for expressions. The kind of commands we support are the following. Skip, the empty command. Print, the command for printing the value of expressions. Assign, which takes a string and an expression and binds the value of the expressions to the identifier represented by the string, that is, it adds the binding to the hash table. Conditionals, if expression, then command, else command. You know how this works. Repeat, repeat expression, command, which is basically a stupid version of the for loop. But you know, repetition legitimizes. Repetition legitimizes. While, while, expression, command. Crazy, right? And finally, concatenation takes two commands and constructs their sequential composition. So execute the first and then the second. Now for the actual interpreter. The interpret command function takes a command and hash table and does not return anything. The reason why it does not return anything is that it only changes the internal state of the interpreter. We match over the command and for each case we provide the expected behavior. In the case of a skip, we just return without altering the state. In the case of a print statement, 
we evaluate the expression that we want to print, and then we use an auxiliary function ppValue to turn the value into a string, which we can then print. The pp in ppValue stands for pretty print, by the way, before you start thinking about anything else. For assignments, where the left hand side is a string and the right hand side is an expression, we compute the value of the right hand side and then we store the identifier value pair in the hash table. If the value is a boolean, we store 0 or 1 based on its truth value. In the case of conditionals, we first evaluate the guard of the conditional, which is an expression. Then, based on its value, we choose whether to call the interpreter recursively on the Dan branch or on the else branch. For the repeat command, we first evaluate the expression, and then we use an auxiliary function called getIntValue to transform the result of the evaluation to an integer n. This function fails if the result of the evaluation is a boolean and not an integer. Then it simply calls the interpreter recursively on the body n times. Similarly to the previous two cases, in the case of a while loop, we simply keep evaluating the guard of the loop, and based on the resulting value, we can either call the interpreter recursively or break out of the loop. Finally, in the case of the concatenation of two commands, we first call the interpreter on the first one, and then on the second. Now the interpreter is complete! Let's test it out. There is only one piece of the puzzle left, and honestly, I'm not going to go into too much detail, because I find it a bit boring. As mentioned earlier, the lexer and parser are two programs that, respectively, turn the program into a list of tokens and the list of tokens into a syntax tree. An additional intuition for understanding the difference between these is the lexer only fails if it sees a word or symbol it does not recognize. If you say open a parenthesis and never close it, the lexer is still happy because it was able to assign a label parenthesis to the symbol. The parser is what actually fails if you forget to close a parenthesis, or if you write stuff that makes sense to the lexer, but it's not syntactically correct, like if while repeat 69 closed brace. Since perk is easily integrated with C, I use some C tooling to generate the parser lexa, because you need to be an absolute fool to actually write a parser yourself and not use a parser generator. The tools I decided to use are called flex and bison. In flex, you can use regular expressions to match specific substrings of your program sequentially and turn them into tokens. As an example, if the lexa sees the character colon followed by equals, it generates the token assign. As you can see, the lexa generator is pretty simple. The parser generator is a bit more complicated. You need to declare the tokens, specify the precedences between the operators, define the return type of the grammar rules as a union, choose a starting rule, and finally define all the grammar rules of the language. This looks pretty tidy and nice, but the real pain is that you need to make sure that there are no ambiguities, and in order to understand what the ambiguities consist of, you need to know a bunch of theory about parsers. I took a class on this stuff a couple of years ago, and I spent it playing the KDE version of the game Breakout, so I find the process of solving conflicts extremely frustrating. That being said, by combining the lexer, parser and interpreter, we can finally write our programs as strings and execute them. If you want to contribute to the Perk programming language, there are a couple of links in the description. Everything we do is on GitHub, and we also have a Discord server if you want to chat with us. Bye!